Okay, today we're going to talk about Florence Cathedral, which is popularly called Il Duomo. Mm -hmm. um, now, very briefly, I just want to mention that Florence was, has been called the birthplace of the Renaissance. And it was the Republic of Florence, which was one of the wealthiest in medieval Italy, uh, because of its uh, wool, wooden clothing trade, cloth trade, and uh, because of its banking institutions. So in any case, um, the cathedral, in fact, was uh, predates the Renaissance. It had been built during the Middle Ages, and it dates from 1296, and the architect is known to be Arnolfo di Cambio. Now, um, Florence, as we know, um, is the birthplace of Renaissance art and architecture. And, this, and today, as then, the Duomo or Cathedral still dominates the city. As you can see here, the scale and size of the uh, cathedral um, overwhelms the scale of the rest of the city. And in fact, the later Renaissance architect, um, uh, uh, Leon Battista Alberti, said that the cathedral is so large that it covers all of Tuscany, which is the province in which Florence is situated, um, with its shade. Now here we see the cathedral uh, in its relationship to the other buildings surrounding it. And uh, of course it is the most majestic um, building in the whole city of Florence. The cathedral, as I said, was built during the Middle Ages. And here we have the complete plan of it, but it remained um, without a dome for uh, about two centuries. So it was built up to this point uh, beginning in 1296 and then it remained incomplete because in the next century the what is called the crossing was enlarged from the original design but nobody could figure out how to put a dome on such a large span which is 140 feet and so the cathedral remained without a dome for a very long time until the Renaissance until a man, an ingenious man, by the name of Filippo Brunelleschi came along and it was Filippo Brunelleschi who came up with an ingenious design in 1420 um, to, his proposal was to cover the dome with his design. Um, now, I will mention uh, how it is ingenious, but it took him 16 years until 1436 to complete the dome. Now, what are the ways in which he was able to achieve what nobody else had been able to achieve for, for a, a couple of centuries? So, let's um, look at what he uh, proposed. Let's look at the profile of the dome. It's not a hemispheric dome, meaning it's not a semicircle. It's actually taller than a hemispherical dome. So we will talk about that. And then let's also look at its construction, which we will discuss in a moment. Okay, now what Brunelleschi did, he did three things. Um, which were radically different from what anyone else had done. Number one, instead of having a hemispherical traditional dome, Brunelleschi came up with a profile which is much more vertical. And this is called an ogival profile. What is the advantage of that? Well, in any building, um, there is the, the load of the roof has to be carried to the ground. The structure, the, the roof load goes through the walls of the building and then they go into the ground. Now the challenge is the vertical vector is fine, that is simply absorbed by the walls. But it is the horizontal vector which creates the problem. And that is why for a hemispheric dome, the wall thickness needs to be very great because this is the horizontal vector that needs to be absorbed by the thickness of the wall. In an ogival dome, because, of, because the verticality is greater than the horizontality, 
as compared with the hemispheric dome, the vertical vector is far greater than the horizontal vector. So, the, therefore, the dome, which is a hemispherical dome, because of the great vertical, the greatness of the horizontal vector, the tendency of the dome is to spring out. It constantly wants to straighten itself, the curvature. Whereas in the ogival one, the, the horizontal vector is small, therefore the springing action is very small. So, the thickness of the walls does not have to be so great to absorb this small horizontal component. And the vertical vector simply just goes down into the ground through the walls, the verticality of the wall, so it's not a problem. So one uh, innovation was the ogival section with a much smaller horizontal component uh, of the vector. The second innovation that Brunelleschi did was that instead of having a solid masonry dome, whether in stone or brick, he came up with this novel idea of a double shell dome. Now this double shell dome, as you can see, you can see the two shells which are then braced or connected and joined by a series of these ribs. And those we can see, there are 24 in all, but every eight of them are expressed as prominent ribs, and then smaller ones are in between which are not expressed on the outside. So out of the 24 ribs, we have the expression of the major eight, which form the octagonal, in the octagon in plan, which you see the major eight ribs here which I expressed out on the outside. The, the minor ones are not really expressed, the major ones are expressed, and they are expressed in white sandstone. So here we have the octog octagonal dome with the major ribs being expressed uh, in the octagon. So this was Brunelleschi's way of reducing the, the total weight of the dome by simply having two thin shells connected with ribs rather than a solid thick dome. Now when you redu reduce the overall weight of the dome, obviously the, com the vectors also are reduced. So the horizontal vector becomes even smaller, which is the problem vector, and the vertical one too is reduced. That's not really a problem. Um, so both the ogival section and the double shell dome are working together to reduce the horizontal vector of the dome. Now the ribs actually introduce stiffening into the dome because when you have ribs, now here is a paper which is quite flimsy uh, without any ribbing, but if I introduce ribbing into the same thin paper, you will see just, just by the, because of the introduction of the ribbing, the flimsy paper becomes a lot stiffer. It's no longer as flimsy as it would otherwise be. So ribbing without adding any significant weight, or in this case no weight at all, uh, actually makes the structure much stiffer and therefore much stronger. The third thing that Brunelleschi did was that he introduced a heavy lantern at the top of the dome. Now this heavy lantern we see, which is beautiful visually, so in terms of the architectural expression, it is beautiful, but contrarily to what I've been talking about in terms of the reduction of the weight of the dome, it actually increases the weight of the dome. But that actually aids in stabilizing the dome because what ends up happening is that the ribs at the top, which want to which want to spring out and straighten themselves are now actually held tight by this lantern and the weight of the lantern down is actually also pulling the ribs inwards at the top. So they are held in rather than springing out and straightening themselves. So all in all, these three things, one, the ogival profile of the dome, two, the double shell, the double shell nature of the dome as opposed to a solid heavy dome, and the third thing, the heavy lantern, 
which adds weight but brings in the ribs at the top all help to stabilize the dome. Now Brunelleschi was an ingenious architect. He has been in fact called the father of Renaissance architecture. Uh, this is the first structure that architects study in architecture history when we start we study the Renaissance. Um, the, the engineering in ingenuity of Brunelleschi is self-evident, um, uh, but he, not only that, the, the bits, construction of the dome would not have been possible without the machinery that Brunelleschi designed in order to construct the dome. So that in itself was a huge innovation, something which greatly impressed Leonardo da Vinci in, year, in the years to come. In fact, Brunelleschi was so honored uh, because of his design and construction of this dome that he was buried in the crypt of Florence Cathedral, something that no uh, ordinary person had achieved. Uh, only saints and, and extremely revered people at that point had been buried in its crypt. Uh, and up until this time, architects were simply considered craftsmen. Uh, they weren't honored in that way. So uh, through this design, Brunelleschi achieved a, a almost a level of divinity which later architects and artists of the Renaissance would emulate. Thank you.